Hey everybody, in this video we'll be talking about gravimetric analysis. Gravimetric analysis is a quantitative technique that measures the mass of a particular substance. There are two types of gravimetric analysis, precipitation and volatilization. In the precipitation method, the quantity of an ion is measured by measuring the mass of a precipitate that can be formed from the ion itself. In contrast, in the volatilization method, the mass of a mixture or compound is measured before and after heating. The intention here is to use the heat to remove a volatile substance that is present in the mixture or compound. We will discuss these two methods individually in this video. In the precipitation gravimetric analysis, a substance is added to the analyte of choice such that a precipitate is formed. For example, if we want to determine the concentration of sulfate ions in a solution, we can add a solution of barium nitrate to the solution containing the sulfate ions to produce a precipitate, that is, barium sulfate. This is shown in the picture on the right. It is important to keep in mind that barium nitrate must be added in excess to ensure that every sulfate ion reacts to form the precipitate of barium sulfate. Otherwise, when we measure the mass of the precipitate, we will underestimate the amount of sulfate ions present in the solution. Once the precipitate is formed, the mixture is filtered to isolate the precipitate. Then the mass of the precipitate is measured and used to calculate the quantity of the ion that was present in the sample in the beginning. The mass of the precipitate is proportional to the amount of analyte present. For example, the more sulfate ions there are in the solution, the heavier or more barium sulfate precipitate will produce. This schematic breaks down a typical precipitation method of gravimetric analysis quite effectively. We will start by measuring the total mass of a particular mixture, followed by dissolving it in water. When it is completely dissolved, we will add a suitable substance to the solution to produce a precipitate. Again, it is important to add the substance in excess in this step to ensure that every possible ion that we want to analyze reacts to form the precipitate. The next step is to pour the solution with the precipitate into a filtration apparatus to separate the precipitate. This is usually performed using a vacuum filtration as it is more effective and provides more accurate results than normal filtration using only gravity. In the last step, the isolated precipitate is dried to remove any residual amount of water. Once drying finishes, the precipitate is weighed and its mass is used to quantify the amount of analyte in the original mixture or compound we dissolved in the beginning. Let's reinforce the sequence of steps using a common example, the analysis of a fertilizer. Fertilizers usually contain sulfate and phosphate ions, both of which easily form precipitates with numerous cations. One of these ions is barium ions. Precipitation gravimetric analysis is often used to quantify the amount of sulfate or phosphate ion that's present in a sample of fertilizer. First of all, the fertilizer that we want to analyze is weighed and dissolved in water. Some components of the fertilizer are not soluble in water, so they are filtered before continuing to the next step. The filtrate, which now contains the sulfate or phosphate ions, is treated with excess barium ions. This is usually in the form of barium nitrate or barium chloride. Both solutions are quite soluble. The precipitate formed between barium and sulfate or phosphate ions is then separated using filtration. In the final step, the precipitate is dried and weighed. Before we continue to discuss how the mass of the precipitate is used to calculate the amount of sulfate or phosphate ions, it is important to note a few major assumptions we have made throughout the analysis. Since sulfate and phosphate ions can be both present in a sample of fertilizer, this method only works if the fertilizer contains only one of these ions. Thus, we are assuming only one type of ion in the fertilizer, that is either the sulfate or phosphate, is precipitated by adding barium ions. In addition, since we do not know how much sulfate or phosphate ions there are in the fertilizer, we can only assume that the barium ions that we are adding is in excess. 
and we ensure that it is in excess by usually adding a large volume of highly concentrated barium solution. When performing filtration, it is important to rinse the precipitate in the filter paper with distilled water. In this step, we are assuming rinsing will help us remove any substances that's not the precipitate or water. While this is ideal, you can imagine it is not very realistic. Let's have a look at how we can use the mass of the precipitate to quantify the amount of sulfate ions in a sample fertilizer. A 0.455 gram mixture or sample of fertilizer contains calcium sulfate. This is dissolved in water and treated with an excess of barium nitrate, as we discussed earlier. And this results in the precipitation of barium sulfate, which is then weighed in the final step. And this number turns out to be 0.6168 grams. The first step is to write a net ion equation to represent the chemical reaction that occurs between barium and sulfate ions, which produces barium sulfate. Luckily, this is already balanced, and as you can see, the ions react in a one-to-one -one ratio to produce one equivalent of the precipitate. Using the mass of the precipitate, we can then find its moles, and this is by dividing by the molar mass. This gives us 2.64 times 10 to the power minus 3 moles of barium sulfate. Using the stoichiometric ratio, we can then work out the moles of sulfate ion present, which is exactly the same. So 2.64 times 10 to minus 3 moles. We can then convert this number of moles back into mass by timesing by the molar mass of sulfate. This gives us 0 0.2539 grams. In the final step, we can find the percentages by mass of sulfate ions in the fertilizer by dividing the mass of sulfate ions by the original mass of fertilizer that will weigh at the beginning of the analysis. This gives us 55.81%. The second method of performing gravimetric analysis is volatilization. This is when we measure the change in mass of a substance when we remove volatile substances from heating. A good example of this is the analysis of sodium hydrogen carbonate, which is a common ingredient of baking soda. This is done by reacting the sodium hydrogen carbonate with an acid in excess. The reaction between a metal carbonate and acid produces salt, water, and carbon dioxide. As the carbon dioxide is produced, it leaves the solution, causing the total mass of the reaction mixture to decrease. Since we know the mass decrease is due to the gas leaving the open system, this is used to calculate the number of moles of the gas, for example, the carbon dioxide, which is then used to quantify the amount of analyte, for example, the sodium hydrogen carbonate. While performing this type of analysis, we are again assuming the substance we are adding to produce the gas is in excess. This is often tricky to ascertain as we do not know the amount of the analyte in the sample. Furthermore, the second assumption is that the mass change is only due to the gas produced from the reaction. Sometimes there may be more than one gas produced, or the gas may be produced from an unaccounted chemical reaction. Let's look at how the mass change before and after heating can help us determine the amount of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So the amount of sodium hydrogen carbonate in a one gram sample of baking soda is analyzed using volatilization. This is by reacting with excess sulfuric acid. The mass change before and after the reaction is 0.26 grams. And we want to use this number here to calculate the percentage by mass of the sodium hydrogen carbonate in the baking soda. Again, assuming the mass decrease is due to the production of carbon dioxide, we can say that the mass of carbon dioxide is 0.26 grams from which we can calculate the number of moles of carbon dioxide by dividing the mass by the molar mass of carbon dioxide. This gives us 5.91 times 10 to minus 3 moles. Using the balanced chemical equation and the stoichiometric ratio between carbon dioxide and sodium hydrogen carbonate, we can also find that the number of moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate equals to 5.91 times 10 to minus 3 and this is because they are in a one-to-one -one reaction ratio. 
The next step is to find the mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate by multiplying the number of moles by the molar mass of the compound. This gives us 0.496 grams. The last step is to calculate the percentage by mass of the sodium hydrogen carbonate as part of the baking soda sample. We do this by dividing the mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate by the mass of the sample to obtain the final value of 49.6%.